subject today, I'm trying to do chapter 6 of Romans. Um, I, I, I mentioned some of you earlier, um, I, I have, I've, I've really, I've really loved to prepare for today. Um, I've got, I've got wonderful family resources. Um, I, I, I've called, I've called Nathan in Africa. He's given me, uh, he's given me a lesson or two. I called Greg, who, who just, who just got his PhD. Greg, no, you're not listening, but anyway. Uh, and then I called Pat last night, okay? And so I had a lot of help. Now, the way my children sometimes respond when their dad calls for help is they'll, they'll give me a lesson or two, but then they've got this habit of sending me new books, okay? So I got, actually I got three new books this week, okay? And I, I tell you what, this book uh, by John Barkley, and that's who I tried to remember last week on Grace. Paul and the Power of Grace. This is a fabulous book. I'm going to leave this out because I've, I've read about half of it and I've really gotten a lot out of it. The other is this new commentary that I hadn't seen, The Story of God Bible Commentary, and this one's written by Michael Byrd. It's on Romans. And I've used both of those this week along with my others and have really appreciated it. Now, when you read too much, sometimes what you've got to teach, I've said, comes out like salad, okay? You get some carrots and you get some lettuce and you get some cucumbers and tomatoes. But, you know, if you like the salad dressing, it don't come together. So if I'm all over the place today, just understand, hey, folks, I'm doing my best here, okay? So where we've been up to this point in time, we've talked, we've been up through, the, through Romans, and we've had the introduction of grace. Now, the biggest part, the biggest problem of grace, the biggest problem with grace and the Israelites, the Jewish people, is that... They just don't get how God gives something freely to people, okay? They just don't get it. They don't understand how it is that you can get grace. In fact, how everybody in the world, non-Jewish, can be given grace. And somehow or another, there's just no requirements or whatever, okay? <clears throat> so the question comes up two or three times with their understanding of grace is, shall we sin more that grace may abound? They've got this confused state or confused understanding about grace. This is why I really like John Barclay's book so much because it introduces some ideas about grace and ways in my mind to teach about grace that I really appreciate. Hey, you all know, uh, let's see here. There's a song about Santa Claus. Uh, it's, it's called Santa Claus is Coming to Town. Does anybody know the words of that? Yeah. What? Oh, you better. Checking a list. Well, how did it even start that way? Santa Claus is coming to town. No, he's making up lists. Checking it twice. Don't find out who's naughty or not. Santa Claus is coming to town. See, Jimmy. He knows if you've been bad or if you've been good for goodness sake. Who? All right. Let's talk about Santa Claus and Grace for a moment. <laughs> is Santa Claus gift? Is Santa Claus gift at Christmas time? Is that Grace? You said yes. Well, for me, because I never really deserved it. 
<laughs> okay, okay, never <laughs> Tune Ellen, I got it. Somehow or another, I may even believe it. Okay? <laughs> but you know, if we th think about that song, he's making a list, checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty or nice, because at the end of the day, who gets the gifts? The nice. The nice. And who gets the cold? The cold. People have been so nice, okay? So now that song is very much about those that deserve it, right? Okay. At the end of the day, when you all got your gift, did anybody ever write a letter to Santa Claus asking what you telling Santa what you wanted? Oh, I did. My children did. I instructed them a bit about what to ask for and what not to ask for. <laughs> but I asked them, has, have any of you ever written a, Santa, a, a note to Santa Claus telling him thank you afterwards? Okay? All right. So I want to contrast that a little bit with grace, okay? Because as I understand grace, grace is given without you deserving it. Very much. That's very much about grace. Okay. But now I also want to respond very much to what John Barclay has written and what he has taught me this last week, which I swallowed. And that is there are expectations with grace. And I talked about this last week. That being in the ancient Near East, no gift is ever given without some expectation of some relational change occurring because of it. Okay. He would go to say that it is a, uh, a, a thought of Western culture or a thought in Western culture that grace is something freely given, freely received, with no strings attached whatsoever. He would say that that's not true. What do you all think about that? What do you think? Grace given with no strings attached. Hey boy, you got grace. You've got grace. I don't care. I don't care how you behave. You've got grace. What do you think? I don't believe that. That bothers you a little bit, Jan? Kind of got a little bit of a look on your face. I don't care how you behave. You've got grace. Mm. Oh. Because I think we can behave in such a way that we cut off that. Oh, you might behave in such a way that you cut it off. <coughs> Not, not that, mm. Let's think about this. I'm thinking. So let's go back. Let's go let's back. June, June Ellen talked about, well, we agree grace is freely given. Okay? Now, this, this, look here. This is something, if y'all are wrestling with this, we've wrestled with this through Christendom <coughs> forever. Yeah, we wouldn't. Are we talking about grace at the uh, judgment? We the are final talking, judgment? Uh, yes, we're okay. talking about grace at the final judgment. We're talking about grace in your life today. Okay. We're talking about grace. We're talking about grace freely given from the cross forward. Okay. In fact, we're talking about grace freely given from the cross forward. That's retroactive, I believe. When he said when we were talking in Romans mm -hmm. that um, our lives could be so that God gives us over to our sinful. Yeah. Is that your heart can be so hardened that God just gives you over gives you in over. a sense? So is that is grace cut off? I wouldn't say grace is cut off, okay? Are you, are you can grieve the spirit. Here's, here, here, here's, the, here's the issue at hand, okay? Here's the issue at hand. If we view grace as something freely given, okay? Freely accepted with no strings whatsoever attached, no expected response in your behavior. If we, re, if we are there, okay? Then couldn't we be with the people that say, Paul, shouldn't we sin that grace may abound? What, what's the purpose, Paul? If we're absolutely graced, regardless of how we behave, okay? And what I would, what I would say was, is this, and this, this was helpful to me. So God initiates grace regardless of who you are, regardless of, of your ethnic group, whether you're a Jew, Gentile, regardless, grace is given, Okay? Now there, I do. I also believe that there's an acceptance of that grace, 
okay? And I think there's an initiation acceptance, okay? And then I think there's a continued way of living where you live into that grace and live into that expectation, okay? And I do think that there's that point in time, okay, where there is a judgment, okay? And I think we, in fact, are judged by our works as to whether we accepted grace in our life and allowed God to work in us to, in fact, make us a new creation, okay? Well, we can reject that gift. Yes, you can reject the gift. Reject. I mean, the point that I would raise is there are people who I think would confuse what I just said with works righteousness. With works righteousness. Y'all follow me? Okay, it's not by works that we are saved. Okay, it's through the grace of God. So where are <coughs> works? Okay, and I would, I would argue that works is in your response to the grace that has been freely given. Okay? Now that's where I'm coming to you all with grace and this idea of grace not being as Bonhoeffer would describe it as cheap grace. Grace that's given on top of grace, on top of grace, regardless how people choose to behave in their lives. Okay? Y'all okay with that? Now, I want to show you a diagram that I have carefully written with perfect spelling <laughs> that anybody could understand this. And this is a timeline. This is from the beginning of the world all the way through eternity, okay? And here's some timelines, some points on that line I want you to think about, okay? Paul, in his writing, is going to describe what are two great spheres, two great spheres, two great moral spheres that humanity's been a part of, okay? And those two moral spheres are going to be separated by one thing, and that's the cross of Jesus, okay? Because at the cross of Jesus, there is an incredible change that takes, takes place and how we live our lives and how we understand we can live our lives. I think, I think, uh, that this first sphere, which I call the sphere of sin and death, actually Paul called it that, I think, okay? The sphere of sin and death for humanity ended at the time of the cross, okay? Now, for individuals, I think this sphere of sin and death ends at a time when you accepted in your personal life in baptism. Okay? And we're going to talk a bit about baptism today. I told you that we would try to do that. But this sphere of sin and death is characterized by Paul with a number of comments, okay? A number of characterizations. He talks about Adam, okay? In chapter 5, we talked about Adam as compared to Christ, okay? Adam being representative of this sphere. We talk about law. In fact, Paul would sometimes refer to it as the law of sin and death, okay? He talks about the body of sin. And ultimately, he talks about death within this sphere, okay? That's what he ultimately talks about. Then there is the cross, okay? And on the other side of that cross, Christ's death, we have the sphere of the Spirit. The sphere of the Spirit, okay? The sphere of the Spirit, which we're all asked to enter into which is brought into our space by grace, okay? With the cross, with grace, sin and death are done away with. They are mastered. They are killed, okay? For humanity in a sense, okay? This sphere is characterized by Christ. It's characterized by grace. It's characterized by a new creation, okay? This idea that we are formed new. Now there is a point in this, and this is the point that we're going to spend some time on in the next, some today, and some certainly the next couple of weeks. And this is a time that some theologians have characterized as already not yet. Okay? Have y'all heard that phrase before? The already not yet? This is, the phrase, this is a period of time that I would characterize as the, between the time that we are initiated into the kingdom of God, into the kingdom of His Spirit, okay? The sphere of the Spirit by baptism. We'll, we'll talk about that here in just a minute. And it's from that time to a time that I call glorification. 
It's a time at the end of the world where we're judged. When our bodies are transformed in such a way that I believe that we are truly sinless in the sight of God. Okay? That's what I believe. But in this already not yet, it's a hard time. It can be a hard time for all of us. Because even though we're in the sphere of the Spirit, even though we have received grace, we still have our shortcomings. We are still in bodies that are exposed, okay, to sinful urges, to sinful activities. So we fall short of what we know we should be. In a plain word, Christians aren't perfect either. Christians are trying to be perfect. Christians are struggling to improve. And just, I'll throw this in as part of this whole idea. It's not just that God saves you. It's that God, we are being saved through the Spirit in us that is constantly sanctifying us. It's constantly cleansing us. It's constantly maturing us if we accept His work in us. Okay, any comments on this right here? A little, it's a little much here. A question? Yeah, Jim. <clears throat> does your spirit have to mature? Okay, does your spirit... Does the spirit mature? In yeah, you? okay. So, you see where I'm going? Yeah, I, I, I do, and I think it's a complicated answer, and I'm not sure... I'll give you what I think, but I'm not going to tell you right or wrong because my own mind is in the spirit, uh, is in the maturation phase, I think, of what all this means. So, you know, common in my, in my teaching, in my past, what I've been taught, is that we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit when we're baptized. Y'all all there? <laughs> See, that works until we get to some passage in, passages in Acts where we find that there are people that had been baptized that didn't have the Spirit, or people that had the Spirit that had been baptized, and we know it doesn't always just work like that. Okay? So, for me, baptism is not this formula and this rational thing where I believe in God, I walk down the aisle, I get myself baptized, I get the Holy Spirit, and I'm on my way. Okay? I think we've got to understand that it's not quite that formulaic, formulaic, okay? I think we've got to believe, if Paul, Paul teaches that part of the belief process is the Spirit working in you or working on you such that you come to believe. I think in a very real sense, we're all born with the Spirit indwelling us, in a very real sense, okay? I think with baptism, that gift is realized in a way that we've never realized it before. Does it reach critical mass there? Or no, it, no, no. When it Paul, Paul sometimes asks for a greater measure of the Spirit. He okay? still thinks he needs more. I think that Paul knows that we all need more. We all need that maturation of the Spirit within us that causes us to be sanctified, that causes us to grow in maturity in Christ. And I think that's an ongoing process for all of us. I think it'll be a process to the day that we die and we appear before the Master and we are judged for how we have behaved, okay, and glorified with Him forever. I think up to that point in time, it's a growing process for all of us. I've not known anybody in my life who have reached that point where they couldn't do better. I know I hadn't. I know I hadn't. I've been a Christian a long time. And sometimes in retrospect, I amaze myself. Absolutely amaze myself. How could I do such stupid, foolish, simple things and be mature as I am? How could I do that? How could I think in such and such a way? I, I can freely say that because I could say it about every one of you. <coughs> That's who we are. So I believe the Spirit, yes, I believe the Spirit matures over a period of time as we grow in Christ. Let's talk about that initiation just for a minute. We talked about baptism last week, briefly, okay? And in today's chapter 6, we very much talk about baptism, okay? We talk about baptism in a couple of different ways. Let me just read a bit of this for you, if I could. So verse six, uh, chapter 6 starts off with a question that I raised. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? 
May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Died to sin, still live in it. What are you talking about, this dying business? Verse 3, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, Messiah Jesus, have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we might too walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin, uh, body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. Okay? So we've got this explanation of baptism here. All right? And this explanation of baptism, to me, is it's very, very interesting. When you read this, do you think about any particular Old Testament ideas? Do you see the Old Testament coming through at all here? Do you see any comparison at all to slaves from Egypt <clears throat> crossing over the sea and the sea party and walking out of it. You see any comparison there? Can you see for just a moment that there is a huge, huge grace that is given to the Israelite people right there? This huge grace offering such that they're undeserving slave people but yet they're freed from it? there's a lot of descriptions about baptism and comments about baptism through the gospels Jesus <coughs> speaks of baptism in Mark 10 and he talks about baptism in a sense of his crucifixion <coughs> let me look that up just a minute Mark 10 I believe that's where it is Yeah, Mark 10. Uh, about 32, Jesus starts talking about he's walking his disciples to Jerusalem. Behold, we're going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and will deliver him to the Gentiles. They'll mock on him, spit on him, scourge him, kill him, and three days later he'll rise again. Uh, his disciples said to him, Grant that we may sit in your glory, one on your right, one on your left. In verse 38, Jesus says to him, You don't know what you're asking for. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? Talking about his death there. It's a different kind of different kind of view. So with baptism, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about two processes here. I'm thinking about death, and then I'm thinking about life. Paul says in Galatians something like, I'm dead, but I live in Christ. Christ lives in me. Y'all know that scripture? Somewhere in Galatians, the second or third chapter. It's not I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. I believe that's better. Okay. What do you all think in the process of baptism? Okay. What do you think about yourself having died? Because that's a big part of Paul's argument. You die. You ever thought about that? Yeah, Dave. I didn't think about that. I thought of it in terms of if I'd been born again. Yeah, I, yeah. But, I didn't, you know, but in my young mind, I didn't connect the death part, but it's not down there. So, so David, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I, I was baptized for remission of my sins. 
that my sins would be washed away, and that was the biggest emphasis in teaching I had. Anybody else there? That's kind of where I think I was, okay? All right? And that somehow or another being washed clean, I'm washed clean. On the other side, I've got, I'm this sinless person, okay? Before, I'm nasty. Now, I'm washed, and now I am clean, okay? Happy days, I'm a Christian, okay? Look here, I don't want to, I, I don't want to negate that. I think that's fine. But I want to be just a little deeper, which I think Paul is here, okay? Paul says the first thing you've got to do is you've got to die. And Paul makes it very clear, you don't just die on your own, you die in Christ. You die in Christ. You die the death that He died. You're with Him somehow or another. And look here, in our rational North American minds, it's hard sometimes to get our arms around this, okay? The thought of how it is that you would die with somebody that died 2,000 years ago. That's kind of hard, okay? But Paul says in some very real way, you die with him, yourself dies. Okay? And then beyond that mystery, you also, as Christ, you participate with him in resurrection. Okay? And that resurrection is defined by Paul as a new life. Okay? It's not like somehow or another with baptism, somehow or another you're changed in such a way that now you you, you can deal with sin right now because you've been made, made new, okay? You're cleansed, okay? You've accepted the grace. And by George, if you go out and sin, all you've got to do is pray, God, take this sin away, and grace is on you because you, you accepted Jesus. No. No, that's not how it is. The teaching is that when you're raised, you're actually raised a new creature, okay? There's something that is very new about you. New in the sense that you now, you now, by virtue of grace, have power in God that you've never had. And I hesitate to say that you have it. It's more like you hold that power. That power is within you. You're dead. It's now Jesus. It's His Spirit that's living in you that allows you to live a good life. Okay? That's baptism, folks. That's baptism. You know, I think... I think that there's been criticism of my heritage in terms of baptism as works salvation. Y'all get it? Work salvation? You understand how baptism could be work salvation? You understand that? Somehow or another, I think I portrayed that just a minute ago. Somehow or another, you take it on yourself. Mm, I know a way. I know a method. I've read the latest how-to book, How to Get My Sins Forgiven, okay? And I'm going to go down and I'm going to get myself baptized, okay? And then I'm going to be raised, i got a new life, and all i got to do is ask God, and my sins are taken away. Okay? Sort of like the guy on Old Brother. Kind of like what now? The guy on Old Brother. Old Brother? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that image, Jimmy. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I think what Paul would want to teach us is that in fact you're not even yourself anymore. You're not even you're not you're not that old person. You are a new creation. You're created in God. That right here at the cross, at the cross, this power of sin, this power of sin was overcome by God's, by Jesus' gift, okay? His gift of grace has overcome that. So we're not so absolutely hamstrung by it anymore. We're not. We're not. So Paul, Paul says, Paul says, if you understand this, if you understand this, how can you continue? How can you continue to continue to wallow in sin? How can you continue to let this sinful life rule who you are? I mean, I, th I think about addiction. Okay, that's the easiest one for me. To, um, I, I don't know. I've never had any problem with stealing, and I've had just a little problem with lying. <laughs> but you know the thought of addiction okay the thought of being addicted and, and I'll tell you right now this country in my opinion is in the absolute grips it's in the grips of gambling addiction okay and by the way Peyton has let me down on that Amen. I'm, 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 I'm pretty tired of that one you know as if gambling as if gambling <coughs> is not addicted. 
as if as, as if if you've got enough money to trash it gambling, okay, that you don't have enough money to help somebody do something reasonable with it, okay? I'm sorry. I'm off on that one. I don't, I don't mind a penny bet and a little fun. I don't mind that at all, okay? But when you let it get past and it becomes an addictive behavior where you're spending your money that you can use somewhere else, that's a problem and shame on people that promote it. Go Big Orange. <laughs> what do y'all think about uh, the idea of sacrament? Y'all know, know what a sacrament is? I need, a, I need a good Catholic to speak up about sacraments. How many sacraments are there? Um, marriage is a sacrament. Marriage is a sacrament. Extreme unction. Huh? Extreme unction. Yeah. Prayer for those dying. That's one. Eucharist, Lord's Supper is one. Baptism is one. That's, that's five of them. There's a couple more. In Church of Christ, and most Protestant churches, we practice what amounts to three sacraments. We talk about sacrament of... <coughs> say it. Baptism. Okay. We talk about Lord's Supper as being sacramental. And we also talk about the sacrament of the Word. Okay. Those are things that we talk about in Church of Christ. So what exactly is a sacrament? And how would you compare what we view as sacramental to what maybe the Jews performed, which circumcision? Okay. How is circumcision different from baptism? Dad, you got your hands up. What do you think? How is baptism different from circumcision? Baptism was spiritual. Baptism was spiritual. Let's think why you might say that, because I'm thinking that in both Jeremiah and Deuteronomy, there are comments that are made, which is there's a day coming when circumcision will be of the heart and not just of the body, right? Yeah, so there's a difference right there. Certainly, that's a difference. What else, where else might you see a difference? Yeah, well, David. circumcision was visible and the new one is invisible, really. Uh, okay, uh, circumcision is visible, the new one isn't. Because they're, they're pretty much signs, uh, a visible sign of grace is what I think okay. the sacraments are understood as being. Well, first of all, I'm going to tell you that if I was circumcised, it would not be visible. <laughs> okay. well, all right? All right? <laughs> just, just saying, David. <laughs> I guess the second thing I'm thinking, okay, is that there might be signs of the Spirit in your life and baptism by the way you act, the way you live, okay? So there is an outward sign, but it's not a simple sign. It's a sign that's followed with action, right? James would tell us that. Things that are sacramental, I think, are very important because they point to something in the church, okay? They point to a point in the church where we receive grace, okay? It, it points to that. I mean, I think it's very sacramental in that sense. When you take the Lord's Supper out here, okay, we think, I think so much, we think about thankfulness for the forgiveness of sins that we have, okay? Right? We think about forgiveness of sins. And certainly that was accomplished at the cross, right? But the corollary and the initiation, I think, of Eucharist, Lord's Supper, is in fact baptism. Do you ever think about your baptism at time of the Lord's Supper? Hmm? And we're thinking about baptism in the Lord's Supper. What is it? What is it that you think? What, what would you think about? His sacrifice. I've told you all many times my favorite piece of art in the whole wide world. <clears throat> that part that a lot of times they cut out and they call it the hand of God. Okay? 
they, they're not touching. They're not touching. But to me, that so depicts, that so depicts our life as servants of Christ, our life in this sphere, okay? You've always got God. He's, he, he's, always, he's always reaching down, okay? He's always reaching down for you. He's, he's chasing you. But folks, I just think sometimes you've got to stop and at least look up, raise your hand. God, come get me. I, th I think that's there. And I think that's got nothing whatsoever to do with works righteousness. That's got nothing whatsoever to do with works righteousness. That's what I'm going to teach. Now, I will tell you, this is something that particularly in the Reformed Church, particularly I think in Old Time Presbyterian churches for sure, okay, there's real concern about that because, uh-uh, no, 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 no. No, there's nothing, nothing that we do. Nothing that we do. Nothing that we do for grace. I agree. There's nothing that we do to obtain grace. But I think there is a response in hand that all of us that have grace have, and we've got to nurture that. And we have to grow ourselves into who God is such that we respect that. Y'all are real talking today. I want to hand it to you. It must be all the good questions I'm asking. Trying to keep up. Is that what it is? Am I going too much? Too? It's just a lot. And it's, uh, it's heavy. Uh, let me tell you something. I think this is incredibly heavy stuff, okay? It's, it, June Ellen, this is very, very heavy. And the thing that makes it even heavier is the fact that it is a way of thinking sometimes that we haven't incorporated, okay? The whole idea, it, the whole idea of baptism being an emphasis on both death and resurrection, okay? With what in my life and the way that I went about it was nothing short of new life and resurrection, but nothing about dying, okay? Not in a sense of real death. A sense of being cleansed, yes, okay? I got that. But to me, it's a different way of thinking. I think that when we catch, our, we catch ourselves in difficulties, sometimes, sometimes what we need to ask is this consistent with Christ in me? Is it consistent with Christ in me? Is this consistent with somebody that was, that's been baptized? Pat told me a great story last night. I, I don't know the personality, so it doesn't I don't need to say it. But he talked about this, this guy, this church member, who basically assaulted a preacher, okay, <laughs> verbally, after a sermon. I mean, he went right into it, okay? And the preacher said nothing, and the guy got done. He looked at him and said, are you baptized? <laughs> and the guy sat there and said, well, of course I'm baptized, okay? And the preacher simply said, baptized people don't talk like that. Baptized people don't talk like that. I think we, in our current culture, we've got to continually remind ourselves of how baptized people act. Because it's so, it's so easy it's so, it's so easy. I think it's so easy to fall back. Okay? It's so easy to fall back. I mean, we're, we're in this already not yet. We're in this already not yet. So I know there's times that I do. I understand that. There's times, there's times when it's, it's like I'm back here. And, I, and we're going to talk about that next week some. Because I don't think you go back there. I think Paul understands the already not yet. He already understands. He, he understands you're still in the body, bodily existence. You're still not glorified. You're Christians. You believe in grace. You understand it. You're working on it. You're praying for a spirit, and yet you fall short. He understands that. David? Maybe we don't understand just how huge this problem was when Paul's writing because, you know, let, let's not side with the Judaizers, but let's realize that, you know, Paul goes through 1 Corinthians, Galatians, Colossians, even Jude talks about it, about these Christians who seem like we are going to go ahead and sin so that grace may abound. So the Judaizers are looking at this. They don't understand it. The Christians don't understand it. So no wonder they're going back to the law because if the law is a reflection of who God is, they're saying, what's, why is that so bad? Because we're going to something new and look at what's happening in Christianity. You know, and Paul is always going after these Christians. Why are you living in adultery? Why are you stealing? Why are you? Yes. Yes. And, and this this whole, shall we say more that grace may abound? I think <clears throat> it really threatened to overtake the church at this time. Yeah. See, see, in, in a couple of things. One is like in chapter six. If you read chapter six, Paul will sometimes say you, and sometimes he'll say we. Okay. 
Now, most people interpret that as Paul is posing his own person, we, in the place of those that would not, um, that would be the strong, okay? And then there are you that later on we're going to see in 14, chapter 14, that are characterized as the weak, okay? So we've got this weak language and strong language that's being used, okay? So it's both of them. It certainly is. I had something else I wanted to say, but it flew right out. Anything else? Yeah. No. I was catching it, was, it and throwing it. It was a fly. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for killing that fly. <laughs> the law. Paul, once again, you know, he puts law right here. And he talks about law multiplying sin, but never being an answer. So if you happen to be one of the Jewish people there, and you hear all about this grace thing, and you see these group of Gentiles that do not, don't follow law, okay? We have Paul coming along that offers this simple idea about grace, okay? But you know, here's how, here's how these Gentile alligator worshipers, this is, oh, past alligator worshipers, this is how they're behaving, okay? You know, it's real simple. It's real simple. Let's go to the law. It says, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. It's clear, isn't it? It's easier. At the end of the day, hey, just go there and do your check off, okay? You need to work harder to obey the law. Paul says that just doesn't work. He says it doesn't work, it's never worked. The only thing that will work is grace through Jesus Christ, okay? Now that does not do away with law. Because the law is full of ethical ethical rights, ethical wrongs that help to guide us. But the law could never forgive sin. The law lacked the power to forgive sin. It was only through the grace and the sacrifice of Jesus that sin and death were defeated. Okay, how much time do I have left? Five minutes. Five About. minutes? Get the right chapter here. Verse 15. <clears throat> Paul repeats very much what he began in, in the chapter. What then shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? May it never be. And then he starts giving this comment about slavery. Okay? Now, why do you think the topic of slavery might have been a, a good analogy for those people. That particular house church, those particular house churches. <coughs> think there were any slaves in that church? I think they probably understood it in the Roman Empire. I think they understood something about it. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? You're either a slave to sin, which results in death, or you're a slave to obedience, which results in righteousness. This idea of righteousness being right and covenant with God. Okay? It's all about covenant. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. You've still got bodies. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. This idea of sanctification, this idea of sanctification is growth. It's growing in the spirit, becoming more mature, becoming more like Christ, okay? You can be justified, but not fully sanctified. Y'all got that? You can be justified. You're in a covenant relationship with Him. You're in a saved situation, okay? How little you might know, how immature you might be in the faith, you can be justified. But the process of life in Christ is a process of His Spirit continuing to sanctify us so that, Jimmy, we do grow with a greater measure of His Spirit. and We do become more mature. We become more like we ought to be. 20. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. 
21. Therefore, what benefit were you then derived from the things of which you are now ashamed? When you were, li when you were living in sinfulness, just tell me, how much benefit was that to you? You know, that's, that's something we don't talk about nearly enough, is people who live sinful lives, what are they going to get for it? Okay? And I'm not talking about eternal bliss or whatever. I'm talking about people who think they've got it made, who may be mega rich, who stole what they had, who don't care for the poor, who are sorry human beings. And we look at them, and if we read enough, we'll think, oh my, People Magazine, they're on the cover. How wonderful they must be. Paul doesn't think that. But now having been freed from sin, free, no longer slaves to sin, and instead enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. When does eternal life start? <coughs> For those that are, that are in Christ. No. When does eternal life start? Yeah. Yeah, we're in it, folks. We're in it. We're in it. We, with the good life, that new creation, we're in it right now. Okay? Didn't say that we don't have times where we start wondering. Okay? Already not yet. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, I'm done. Any questions? Bob, any questions from the peanut gallery? Yeah, Carol Petty has posted a thought to hold on to. I am a slave to obedience. I am a slave to obedience? Yeah. yeah. Paul contrasts the two right here, Carol, slaves to obedience as opposed to slaves to sin and death. And in Galatians, it's interesting. He leaves out the slavery to God, but we're definitely on the other side. You're a slave to sin. Paul uses this more than once. Anything else? Okay, next week is chapter 7. Chapter 7. Chapter 7 is somewhat of a controversial text in how we accept that. Some people accept chapter 7 as being a chapter about our life in Christ and the struggles that we have staying in Christ. Um, more modern commentators and people that I have followed take chapter 7 to be a chapter of, that Paul is looking at his life, his former life, before he became a Christian, okay? And then chapter 8 is life in the Spirit, life after you're a Christian. So y'all, please try to read that. If you, read, if you hadn't read your first eight chapters, get after it. Start getting late in the day, you're going to miss it. But I uh, love seeing each and every one of you. I appreciate any of you guys out there that are watching online. We appreciate you all just as well. And, and uh, appreciate your faithfulness and trying to grow in Christ with the rest of us. It's going to be 50 degrees this afternoon. Go out and get some sunshine. Stay six feet away from people. <laughs> love all of you.